Well, we're studying through the five solas. October 31st, you know, we have an October 31st baby. Uh, Jason and Rachel just made it back, by the way, just flew in this morning and just walked in here. Rachel, I'm glad y'all are safe. Good to have y'all with us. And uh, Jason's our October 31st baby. When we went to the hospital that Wednesday night for Karen to deliver him, we left Joshua with some of our neighbors, Captain Joe Day, a P-52 pilot in the Air Force. We got back. Remember, I was a curmudgeon then. We got back, and they had taken him trick-or-treating. He had all this candy. I think they painted him up a little bit. You were all of what, two and a half years old, maybe? I thought, my soul, I've turned my back, and my child's been ruined. October 31st, 1517, 500 years ago, Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk, had been smitten by grace. He said, we got to talk about this. So he nailed to the door of the church at Wittenberg, which would be kind of like putting something on the, on the church bulletin board, 95 concerns he had with the established church. And the rest, as they say, is, is history. Out of the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation of the, of the 16th century, the Reformers, and there were several, I hope you're reading the devotionals we provided for you, those devotional biographical sketches of different Reformers through the month of October. Uh, they agreed. Part of the problem the church had in that day, and I'll be honest with you, it still has today in different corners, is that Scripture alone is our authority. And Scripture, when you, when you take Scripture at face value, you don't mix it in with your opinions, you don't mix it in with traditions, you don't mix it in with, with church councils, with Holy Mother Church speaking ex cathedra. Scripture alone teaches that salvation is by grace alone. Grace alone plus nothing. When you are saved, you bring zero to the equation. We're going to talk a little more about that. And the salvation by grace alone is through faith alone in Christ alone. And when you take the scriptures, your authority, and you realize that this whole process, we talked about this last week, sola gratia, grace alone, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, then you know that you don't, there's not one part of the song, I did it my way, that is appropriate to be sung when you're talking about salvation in Jesus Christ. It's to the glory of God alone. Those are the five solas. And so these five things, these five truths that wrecked the established church of the 16th century and we discovered the gospel brought it back to the forefront we are the heirs of that today but folks we live in a day in post modern post christian pre reformation america when we need a new reformation so today we're looking at sola fide through faith alone. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. We read the passage leading up to that on purpose. Romans 3, 21 to 26. Stand with me if you would. I hope you have your Bible and have it turned to that. If you have your Bible, see me because we want to do what we can to get a Bible in your hands. We have it on the screen for you, the biblical text, but you can't take the screen with you when you leave. You need your own Bible. Romans 3, remember what we read, verses 9 to 20, it, it brought us up to this, it's this reality that by the works of the law, by, by your notion, my notion that I can do something to attract God, do something to interest God, do something to please God, no one will be justified for the law, we're going to talk about that, the law makes us more aware of our sin when we face it honestly. So, verses 21. And following. But now, the righteousness of God 
has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood, to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in His divine forbearance, He had passed over former sin. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And my brothers and sisters, we need a revival of the understanding of sola fide in our time because it has been piled upon with Philistine rubbish, much like the well in Genesis that had to be digged out. Thank you. Please be seated. Sola Fide is also known as justification by faith alone. It's a Christian theological doctrine that distinguishes the Lutheran and Reformed branches of Christianity as well as some other denominations from the, from the Catholic Church, the Eastern, Ortho, Eastern Orthodox Church, and a lot of other folks that piled on as time has unfolded. J.I. Packer, I've mentioned him to you. I've told you before that if you find a book where J.I. Packer has written the introduction or the foreword, buy it. Because J.I. Packer's writing is as clear and keen as anything you're going to find. And I found a great article by him that I'll just commend to you. It's from uh, the Ligonier uh, Ministries, Ligonier.org, The Reformed Doctrine of Justification. Tempted to read it, but it's too long. But he does cite in there G.C. Burkauer, who says, The confession of divine justification touches man's life at its heart, at the point of its relationship to God, the heart of man and the relationship to God. It defines the preaching of the church, the existence and progress of the life of faith, the root of human security, and man's perspective for the future. Sola fide. I told the folks last Sunday night, because remember how we're doing this now, on Sunday nights we're watching a brief video uh, by three excellent Reformation scholars who are just talking about uh, one of these five solas. And so last Sunday night we watched the video on Sola Fide. Tonight we will watch the video Solus Christus, Christ Alone. And I told you last Sunday night, those of you who are here, that, that Martin Luther called this doctrine the standing or falling article of the church. In other words, if you don't get Sola Fide right, it is north on the compass. And if that is skewed, if you think this is north, then it doesn't matter where you're going. You're not going to get where you want to get. The standing or falling article of the church. Sola Scriptura struck at the church's tradition. You remember in, in medieval times, and by the way, it's still true today, when the, when the, when the Pope, uh, and boy, we have an interesting Pope now, when the Pope speaks sitting on, his, on the throne in Rome, he speaks ex cathedra, from the throne, and what he speaks is taken to be infallible. Now, I don't believe that, and you don't believe it. I'm just telling you what, what Catholic dogma teaches. Church tradition. So, if you'd lived in Luther's day, how can I know what I need to know? They would say, from Scripture and Holy Mother Church. Sola Scriptura struck the very foundation of that and said no scripture alone. Remember the Diet of Worms? We read you that a couple of weeks ago where they called him and said, you need to recant of your writings. He said, because they, they contradict the councils of the church and 
the writings of the church, and, the, and he said, look, they've been, the councils of the church contradict one another. Unless I'm convinced from Scripture and plain reason applied to it, I will not. I cannot recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Scripture alone. Grace alone struck at the foundation of the church using relics and things like that. In fact, the church defined grace very differently. And I told you when we looked at that, that they use our vocabulary but not our dictionary. Grace, the church taught and still teaches, is conveyed. Yes, certainly you see grace in the work of Jesus Christ, grace in the love of God, but grace is conveyed, the teaching is, through the sacraments. So if that's why if you ever find yourself sitting in a confessional, call me before you go, but if you ever find yourself sitting there and, and you're asked the question, when was the last time you did make confession? Because it's tied to your receiving of grace. When's the last communion you attended? It's tied to your receiving of grace. So, so grace alone struck at that. Faith alone, however. We told you that, that, that sola scriptura, scripture alone, was call, called the formal principle of the Reformation. It was, that, it was the book. It was the guidebook. It's, it's the authority. Faith alone, sola fide, was called the material principle of the Reformation. Because this was the sum and substance of the matter. That you don't add to the finished work of Christ. And we read that uh, in our in our text. What I want to try to do in the time we have is to look at the need of justification which occurs in our text, the meaning of justification which is implied in our text, we'll give you that, and then the means of justification. The need of justification is, is pretty clear if you look at our text Verse 23 spells out the need, but really verses 9 to 20 spell out the need. So that in verse 21, Paul says, but now our righteousness, by the way, last Sunday night we, we, un, we unfolded, unpacked uh, how that works in Romans. If you remember in Romans chapter 1, verses 6, 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also the Greek, for in the gospel the wrath of God has appeared, has, has showed up, is unveiled against all ungodliness, all wickedness. And he goes to this long catalog of sins. And then as he's doing that in Romans 1, he says, he says you Jews. You see, when he was rattling this off, Paul expected, having been a Jew himself, that the Jews would go, that's right, that's right, Paul. Those Gentiles, nasty, vermin, Gentile. But he says, no, you're no different, Jews. You have all these advantages, all these privileges, all these, all these opportunities, and you sin. You cite the law, but you break the law. So he comes into chapter 3 of Romans in verse 9. All, Jew and Gentile. So I've already made the, made the charge, made the case. The Jew and Gentile, and he gives this litany of the way they act. And by the way, when you read Romans 3, 9 to 20, I want to encourage you to read it sometime today. I want you to think about America today. Because it, it is a fantastic description of America. There's some people, leaders in this country, that I believe if you put a gun to their head and told them, tell the truth, or I'm going to shoot, they'd say, shoot. They, they, they can't do it. They lie with impunity. The culture lies. And so you get this chapter 3, verse 21, but now, having showed that there's, that all have sinned, but now, a, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, apart from law keeping. This idea that I can keep the law. The Pharisees thought they could keep the law, and they rewrote the law to fit, to fit them, which is what you have to do. To stand before a holy God, you've got to create a God of your imagination, a God in your image. You cannot stand before the holy God of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. You cannot on your own, unaided. Moses wanted to see him. God said, I've got to hide you in the cleft of the rock. Because if you gaze full force upon me, you will die. It will kill you. This is the holiness of God. So Paul says, but now, this righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although it doesn't, doesn't render the law meaningless. But Jesus said, 
Don't think that I've come to destroy the law, the problem. No, I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill, to bring them to their, to their biblically intended conclusion and fulfillment. This righteousness of God, verse 22, through faith. The idea of being made right before God. Remember Luther, I told you, Luther was striving to to cultivate the righteousness of God, to show he had a perfect, unmitigated love for God. And every time he failed and he became more and more frustrated so that at one point when he was telling about this to his students after he'd been converted, one of the students said, Dr. Luther, did you love God? He said, love God? I hated God. Now that's Luther, that's the way Luther is. <laughs> Strong. What he was meaning was, I couldn't, there was no way. The harder I tried to measure up to God's standard of righteousness, the more I realized I never would until, until heaven opened and the Spirit applied, the just shall live by faith. And he realized that this righteousness that God demands, he offers in the person of another, in the perfect life. Of Jesus Christ. It's through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. There is no distinction, he says. And this brings us to the need. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I, we, were, we were studying this passage years ago. And I told you I had a professor in seminary, one of my systematic theology professors said, now this, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He said, we have this notion that like here's the glory of God and we kind of, shh, we just, shh, we just miss. He said, no, 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 no. He said, this word for sin here is missing the mark. He said, but I want to show you, get the right picture in your mind of missing the mark. He said, imagine that you have, have a target in front of you. You've been handed a bow and an arrow, and you're, you're called upon to hit the bullseye. And before you do that, I take you, I turn you around, and I say, now draw and shoot. He said, that is the picture of missing the mark. We don't come up short. We don't, we don't just, we totally and completely miss the glory of God. We do not glorify God as unconverted people. That's the need. It's the acknowledgement that God is absolutely holy and that we by nature are sinners. Utterly depraved. I thought, folks, that Depravity is, total depravity doesn't mean that we're as bad as we can be. No, we're not, we're not all Hitlers. We're not all Charles Mansons. But by nature, our hearts have got it in there. And it's only the restraining kindness and mercy of God that holds us back from absolute iniquity. See, if you don't know that about yourself, you say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you, you need to take another, just go back into the Scriptures. Because see, the person not convinced of that will not be convinced of his need of justification. That person will think, well, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not perfect, <laughs> but I never killed anybody. I've had people tell me that for, for decades now. I say, really? You've never, you never been angry? Angry at your mom, angry at your dad, angry at your sibling, ang angry? Well, yeah, damn it. Jesus taught that anger is murder in the heart. You see, we, we, we rewrite the definitions. So there's this need here. Before a holy God, we need a perfect righteousness. And this is what drove Martin Luther crazy. He couldn't get there until he discovered, wait a minute, the righteousness God demands, he provides. In Jesus, it's called alien righteousness is the fancy theological description of it. A righteousness outside of ourselves and completely in another. If you're convinced of the need, you're not far from the remedy. But if you're not convinced of the need, then you're going to think that you've got, you've got part of the potion with you that you can mix together to come up with the remedy. Unwilling, the scripture says, and unable to come to Christ until the gospel breaks through. 
Well, that's, that's the, the need of justification. What is the meaning of it? What is the meaning of it? Look at, look at verse 24, 25. They're justified. I told you about this last Sunday night. And justified freely by his grace as a gift. The word there for the idea of gift is, is really without initiating cause. So that there's nothing we can do to set in motion. We don't, we don't do that. God does that. God took the initiative by sending his only begotten son to live and keep the whole law perfectly than to die suffering the punishment due unto the sins of all who would believe. God took the initiative. We don't initiate. Christianity stands apart from every other religious expression, even, even perverted and distorted forms of Christianity. But true biblical evangelical Christianity stands apart because every other religious expression is teaching you how you can win the favor of God, how you can make your way to God. Christianity, biblical evangelical Christianity tells you about how you could not move one subatomic particle toward God, and yet God in mercy moved toward you and me by sending Jesus Christ. He made the move. He took the first step and the last step necessary for you and me to be saved in Jesus. So that justification, when you see this, justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He redeems us. That is to purchase us out of the auction block of slavery. We sang some songs today that talk about chains, shackles falling off. And that's what Jesus did. He redeemed us, not with money, not even with his works, though his works set him up. He redeemed us with his blood. He bought us. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Righteous Son of God was he. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Justification is an act of God's free grace whereby he pardons our sin. He, he accepts the work of Jesus and says, on the basis of the work of my son, I forgive you. He pardons our sin and accepts us as righteous in his sight. Calvin, who was a legal scholar, said it's imputed righteousness. We talked about that last Sunday night. The difference between infused righteousness, which is, what, which is wrongly taught, and imputed righteousness. It's, you, are, you are counted. It's a, it's a legal transaction. Brothers and sisters, hear me. And those of you who are not yet followers of Christ, hear me. When Christ died 2,000 years ago, his death became available to pay for your sin. And it's a one-time event. Justification means I have been saved from the penalty of sin once for all. Once for all, oh brother, believe it. Once for all, oh sinner, receive it. Redeemed. Redeemed. And all that is necessary is to have faith in him. And we looked last Sunday night that, that faith requires knowledge. It's not, it's not just blind, stupid faith. Faith requires knowledge of who Jesus is. Faith requires assent to, to embrace what is said about him and what is said about you. And it is it's also a trust where you believe God means it, that he's not, he doesn't have a carrot stick in front of you. He's dangling, going to snatch it back. So that when you come to trust in Jesus Christ, all that he has done for sinners like you, you are saved. Not on your way to being saved, 
Not taking the first step and, and having to bring along other, th no, saved. I've had people say to me through the years, well, well it's, it's good that you trusted Jesus, but have you, and then they'll, they'll fill in their little blanks, so have you been baptized in the name of Jesus? Have you, uh, do you take the wafer? Uh, have you spoken in tongues? You see, anything added to the finished work of Jesus Christ undermines the gospel of Jesus Christ. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. Next Sunday, we're going to look at in Christ alone. And this faith, by the way, is a gift of God. We looked at that last week in Ephesians 2. It's not of works. Well, I, just listen to somebody's testimony sometime. This, and, then I, and then I decide, and I, you know, I was like, well, you know, your eyes are way too close together. I, I want to hear more of what Jesus did for you. The proper place for the pronoun I is that Jesus paid it all, all to him. I, I decided this. I walked in. I took the preacher's hand. I prayed the prayer with him. I, he, he. Redeemed us. It's an act of God's free grace whereby he pardons all our sin and accepts us as righteous in his sight, not for anything we have done, praise the Lord, or can do, or will do, but only exclusively because of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. And when you, when you wrap your head and your heart around justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone, it is not hard to get to the place where you say, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Well, what's the means of justification? Look at our text. 25, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood. Propitiation is a big fancy term. Propitiation, a five-syllable word, but it's critical. Don't run away from these things. It is, it is the wrath-appeasing, sin-averting, satisfaction of divine justice so that you and me, a miserable sinner, who deserves nothing but hell from the moment we breathe this earth's atmosphere, given and treated, adopted as sons of the living God and in joint heirs with Christ. God set Jesus forth that way. Who he, we sang it. He made him sin who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that we might become his righteousness, the great exchange, reconciliation where he takes our sin upon himself and he imputes, he takes a, the cloak of righteousness and covers us with it so that God looks at us not as miserable sinners but as sons and daughters bought by the precious blood of Christ and he regards us as if we'd never sinned. In fact, justification, one of the ways, it is just as if I'd never sinned. That's justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. So the means is the death of Christ. And in the death of Christ, you see God's righteousness. He demands it of you, perfect righteousness. He, he supplies it for you in the death of his perfect son. And in doing that, he maintains his holy standard. So that no one can say, well, God, God seemed to deal differently with his sin and then in her sin. It's not like he did No. Every, think about this, every sin that has ever been committed, every sin that will ever be committed going forward must be punished to satisfy the holy, inflexible justice of a thrice holy God. The question is, where are you banking on that? Jesus Christ is the only safe place. When he died on the cross 2,000 years ago, he took every sin that had been committed, every sin that would be committed for all who would come to place faith in him. And faith itself is a gift from God. 
So the, the means is the death of Christ. And I'm going to close with this today. We live in a day in America when there's a fixation on faith in terms of my faith, my faith. The, the doctrine of justification by faith alone and the finished work of Christ alone is a fixation on not the subject of faith, but the object of faith, Jesus Christ. It's what he did, who he is, who he promises to be for us. So that when, not if, when you as a follower of Christ sin, and the devil beats you over the head with that and says, how can you be a Christian? You do, say, look, devil, I'm worse than you know. Thank you for reminding me that Jesus paid for that sin for me. Excuse me while I go praise him for a while. And thank you for how wonderful he is to sinners. You see, that's God doing that now maintains his justice. He can be, in verse 26, that God can be just. He's not unjust. He ceases to be God if he's unjust. He can be just, and at the same time, he can justify. He can, he can pardon and forgive and accept his righteous. He can justify all the one who has faith in Jesus. It's the material principle of the Reformation. I want to ask you, do you have Saving faith. Not saying faith. A lot of people talk about it. Saving faith. Where you've abandoned all hope of anything in yourself. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. In other words, clothe me in your righteousness. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless come to thee for grace. Foul. I've, I've looked in the mirror, I've agreed with what you said, but your assessment of me, God, I am what Romans 3, 9 to 20 says I am. Foul. I to the fountain, the fountain, of, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel. I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. And yet you have every reason to believe that if you've come to see who you are and you will take a serious look at who Jesus is, that by faith, knowledge of him, assent what the Bible says you are and he is, and trust that what he did 2,000 years ago applied to you, you'll be saved. It's glorious. And the fruit of that, when you come to that simple realization that Jesus died for me. I don't need any other argument. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. Sola fide. So two types of folks here today. One, one are followers of Jesus Christ, those who are true followers. And you get frustrated and you, get, you struggle and the devil beats you over the head and, and you deal with your own remaining sin and like Paul wonder what, what am I what am I doing the things I shouldn't do I find myself doing the things I should be doing I find myself leaving undone I'm a wretched person what, what's going to become of me justification by faith alone says take heart it's already been paid it's already been paid don't take your eye off the prize start wallowing in your pity and it's already been paid there are others here, though, who have not yet become followers of Jesus Christ. You've not come to the point where you looked at Jesus and said, I believe. I don't have to figure all this out. I believe. And you, you want to complicate it. The devil wants to be sure you complicate it because he, he has a vested interest in you bogging down and leaving this earth not having figured it out. I just simply offer to you a Savior today who died and rose again that you would be saved. Who is willing to clothe you in his righteousness when you, by faith, say yes. Jesus is my Savior. Salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. It's the glorious gospel it's been clouded up today, folks. Don't be confused by it. Look to Jesus. 
If you're weary and troubled, no light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Simply turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things that trouble you on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Come to Jesus today if you've never trusted him before. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for the gospel, the simplicity of it. Lord, forgive us when we let our so-called intelligence and other things trip us up. Oh, help us, as Jesus said, to be like children, just to become like a child. And See where you offer him in the gospel and receive him. Believe that his perfect life that should have been mine, his perfect life counts for me. And his sinless substitutionary death was undertaken in my place. I should have died. And that his resurrection infallibly proves the truth of this. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me if you would as we sing to be